On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we're going to the Caribbean. We'll discover an ingenious and very considerate way to visit the rainforest in Antigua. On Barbuda, we will watch a colony of magnificent frigate birds. From the Caribbean, we'll go to New South Wales, one of the Australian territories. The breathtaking Blue Mountains are a favorite destination in New South Wales for tourists and mountain climbers alike. Then, to conclude today's adventures, we'll return to the Caribbean. We'll venture to the British Virgin Islands, where we will have the chance to admire beautiful white beaches and crystal clear turquoise waters. Antigua lies where the Caribbean meets the Atlantic Ocean. Anthropologists believe that this island was inhabited as early as the Stone Age. However, it was only discovered by the Europeans when Christopher Columbus made his second sail in 1493. Having endured a short-lived dispute between the French, English, and Spanish, Antigua became a part of the British Empire in 1657. In 1967, the island became autonomous as an annexed state of Great Britain. Then, in 1981, it declared independence under the names Antigua and Barbuda. Immediately what comes to mind when we say Caribbean is hot sun, white sand beaches, and of course, music. And in particular, the sizzling Caribbean beat of Calypso. The bays and lagoons lining the coast are ideal for fishing. Antigua gets ready for bed beneath a fairy tale sunset. The Antiguan tropical climate doesn't consist of scorching heat all year round. In the rainy season, Antigua is lashed by torrential rains. The rain ensures sufficient moisture necessary to nurture one of Antigua's main attractions, the tropical rainforest reservation and its indigenous vegetation. To protect this unique ecosystem, it is forbidden for humans to set foot inside the rainforest. Despite this strictly enforced rule, the Antiguans were pretty resourceful in devising a clever means to make this attraction accessible. In the high crowns of the ancient trees, there hangs a system of ropes and hanging bridges from which the visitors can move using their own weight and strength. Everything is done under the watchful eye of local instructors. Traversing on ropes may appear risky, but the instructors are there to ensure the safety of their tourist clients. And so tourists bored with idling on the beach and bathing in clear waters may embark on this unusual adventure. Up here, they can marvel at the beauty of Antiguan nature while not interfering with it. Um, and a lot of people come here and all they're expecting to see is the seaside and the sand and the sea. Um, so there's a, there was an opening to do something completely different. So we thought we'd do something that was uh, eco-friendly, so it introduced people to other aspects of Antigua and just give another string to the bow of the 365 beaches. Antigua's elaborate coastline offers plenty of hidden bays and lagoons. During their rule, the English picked a bay in the south of one of the islands to create a port. It was given the simple name, the English Harbor. Today, it serves yacht enthusiasts from around the world. On the eastern part of the island, there is a fascinating rock formation known as the Devil's Bridge. The surf hollowed a series of crevices and holes in the limestone, out of which geysers spur. Mother Nature manifests her might with giant waves that unceasingly devour the rocky shores. 
The heavy demand by neighboring islands for the pinkish sand of Barbuda has spurred the sad business of trucking this treasure to the port. The heavy demand is, of course, fueled by the boom of the tourism industry. Because Barbuda is not as easy to get to as other islands, relatively few tourists take the trouble to find their way there. To make ends meet, the local people indulge in this frighteningly short-sighted business venture. are as lovely and unspoiled as you would find on any of the neighboring islands. But in this case, they have the added feature of being secluded and thus deserted, making them ideal for those who truly want to get away from it all. Acquiring the traditional tropical treat, some coconut, requires considerable skill and agility. Barbuda does have its own miracle to share. The biggest colony of magnificent frigate birds in the Caribbean is located here in the Coddington Lagoon. According to American ornithologists, there are 2,000 of these birds nesting here. sport a crimson lobe sack on their necks, which somehow resembles a heart. Despite inhabiting coastal areas, frigates do not swim. Their feathers do not contain the chemical that repels water. As a result, if a frigate bird comes in contact with the water, it simply cannot fly again. Incredibly, frigate birds have a highly developed sense of solidarity. Should a bird fall into the water, others will come to the rescue, trying to use their beaks to fish the fallen bird out and carry it high into the air. When they get their friend to a sufficient altitude, they drop him. The idea being that as the bird's wings dry out from the warm air, he will be able to resume flying and hunting. During the mating season, the lobe sacs of the male birds inflate to admirable proportions. Female frigates lay a single egg a year. After the eggs have hatched, they diligently look after their young. Frigate birds make their home in the mangroves, it is ideal for hatching eggs and for providing shelter from the elements. Mangroves also shelter the island from giant waves, and in particular, hurricanes. It is for this reason that the locals perceive the mangroves as beneficial and not as a nuisance weed. It would be an understatement to say that the people of Barbuda know about hurricanes. And so we must bid farewell to the islands of Antigua and Barbuda. We now move on to New South Wales, one of the states of the Australian Federation. Is there anyone who does not know the two most familiar of all Australian animals? One, of course, is the koala bear. This one seems to be lazily dozing on a eucalyptus bough. 
The second, and equally as infamous, is the kangaroo. They are so dear to the Australian people, they are included as part of the Australian national emblem. They mostly inhabit an area known as the heart of the country. The only functioning NASA base in Australia awaits us in the spacious plains of New South Wales. The Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex was established in the 1960s. Scientists use the succession of telescopes found here to acquire valuable data from and communicate with satellites traveling in outer space. Currently our most distant spacecraft is Voyager 1, which has been out in space now for 30 years. Travelling at 22 and a half kilometres a second, it's now 15 and a half billion kilometres from the Earth, three and a half times further away than Pluto. The signals come back to us at the speed of light, taking 14 and a half hours to reach our planet, and the signal we reach through our big antennas here is 20 billion times weaker than the power of a watch battery. So it's literally a whisper from deep space. In the 1960s, the CDSCC satellites assisted communications between NASA and the Apollo Lunar Module. The crew of Apollo 11 brought back a 3.8 billion year old moonstone, which is now displayed here, commemorating their collaboration with NASA during that 1969 mission. Needless to say, the CDSCC is a bit of an exception in New South Wales. The majority of the land area is used for agricultural purposes. Due to its altitude, this plateau is somewhat different in climate from the nearby subtropical coastline. The landscape has an almost European feel to it. Australian agriculture has a long tradition of raising cattle and sheep. On the other hand, Sydney, the capital of New South Wales, is known for great surfing and kiting opportunities. The New South Wales coastline is adjacent to the Tasman Sea. Seabirds of all kinds thrive here. The Australian pelican is native to these waters. The question is, who happens to be the superior fisherman, the pelican or the human? Due to its mild summers, the climate in New South Wales is ideal for the cultivation of wine. Since other parts of Australia have high temperatures during the summer, grapes from other parts of the country suffer from high sugar content and are only used for making dessert wines. The wine from the Hunter Valley region of New South Wales is superb. Wine has been cultivated here since 1858 when an Englishman, Edward Tyrell, planted the very first vineyard here. It has become a time-honored tradition in the last century and a half. As we head toward the coast, the character of the countryside gradually changes. The countryside becomes more mountainous as we near the foothills of the Blue Mountains.
The Blue Mountains form a part of the Australian Great Dividing Range. The bluish haze that rises from millions of eucalyptus trees, tinting the surrounding sky and mountain ridges, also provided the logical name for these mountains. During the early days of colonization, the Blue Mountains represented an insurmountable barrier to westward progress. The first pioneers followed river valleys, but their efforts were always brought to an abrupt halt by vertical rock faces. The mountain massifs had to first be conquered in order for the plains of New South Wales to be made accessible for settlement. The deep canyons and steep cliffs lure mountain climbers from around the world. Today, climbers, intoxicated by the eucalyptus scent, conquer the rock faces with the same zeal the early pioneers had to conquer the unknown. The local technological wonder is the zigzag railway. In the middle of the 19th century, engineers racked their brains trying to find possible solutions to the challenge of building a railway in such a terrain. The result was a series of turnback ramps, a sort of auxiliary structure built into the rock. This ingenious system would have been forgotten in time had it not been for a bunch of enthusiasts. In the 1970s, they rebuilt the tracks, two tunnels, and a number of viaducts to create a picturesque steam engine train tour on this route. Such a steep ascent may be viewed as a metaphor for the development of the whole Australian society. Don't forget, Australia started out as a British penal colony before evolving into a warm and welcoming sovereign state. But now, it's time for us to return to the Caribbean. back in the paradise of the Caribbean, filled with sun, magical beaches, clear waters, and Calypso. Christopher Columbus also discovered what is now the British Virgin Islands during his second sail in 1493. This archipelago, made up of some 50 islands, lies hidden in the Caribbean Sea, about 60 miles east of Puerto Rico. This stunning place was inhabited by a South American tribe of Indians called the Arawak as early as the year 100 AD. In the 15th century, the Arawak tribe was driven out by the more aggressive Carib tribe. Subsequently, in the 16th and 17th centuries, the Dutch, French, Spanish, Danish, and British all fought for influence throughout the area. Great Britain emerged victorious, and the islands have been under its administration ever since. The islands became an independent British colony in 1960 and gained wider autonomy seven years later. Tortola is the main island, and its capital is called Road Town. There are a great number of other, smaller islands, many of which have private owners. When it comes to holiday venues, Few places can beat a private island in the Caribbean. The multimillionaire Richard Branson has his very own island here called Necker Island. One of the neighboring islands is owned by the Amway Company. The prominent New York psychiatrist Henry Jarecki is also an island owner. Yeah. 
Hundreds of thousands of tourists flock to the British Virgin Islands, or BVI, each year in search of the perfect holiday. As a result, the BVI are among the most thriving regions of the Caribbean. Thanks to the immense efforts of local ecologists, the surrounding nature remains pristine and unspoiled. A variety of tropical crops thrive in the rich soil. What I have in my hand here, it is a breadfruit, come from the breadfruit tree that introduced by Captain Bly from Tahiti. Now breadfruit was brought here mainly to feed the slaves in the 17th century. It is one of the local food staples. When cooked, it closely resembles potatoes or freshly baked bread. The most popular sport here, as in Antigua, is cricket a true British export. The hot climate entices visitors and locals alike to dance. Travelers are attracted to the BVI by steady winds promising ideal sailing conditions. Here, you can see yachts of all imaginable shapes, sizes, and colors. Evening sets over the British Virgin Islands. The weather isn't permanently sunny and peaceful. Hurricanes annually haunt the Caribbean. Since the wind seems to be picking up, we'll bid farewell to the islands, just to be on the safe side. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end, for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will start our adventure in Svalbard, and from there, we will head off to explore the icy wasteland of the Arctic. Later in the program, we will discover the splendor of Canadian nature in two of its French-speaking regions. In Quebec, 100 kilometers inland on the most southerly fjord in the Northern Hemisphere, we will watch the low tides set. In Alberta, we will seek to comprehend the sheer size of the Saskatchewan River and the majestic Rocky Mountains. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature.